ancient Athens, a place we don't have a great modern parallel for, was once the superpower of the entire ancient world. Athens, writes Eric Weiner in The Atlantic, produced more brilliant minds from Socrates to Aristotle than any other place the world has seen before or since. And perhaps we can begin there in the category of wisdom. Athens was indeed the home of Socrates and Plato and the adopted home of Aristotle, the Mount Rushmore of world philosophy all in one location. And there are no reputable undergraduate or graduate classes in philosophy or leadership where you're not reading either some or all of their works. It is arguable that all Western secular philosophy since, since those three are simply commentary on what they wrote then. The pedagogy that has largely endured for about 2,500 years, greatly influencing law schools today, of course, the Socratic method of teaching from how Socrates conversed and taught his students. And Plato was Socrates' a student. Aristotle was Plato's student. So just, by the way, good luck any coaching, coaching tree ever beating those three right there. So these three arguably laid the foundations for all of Western culture. What was value and philosophy? That's where Socrates taught. So think of just a downtown area where everything of note happens. Eating, school, lecture, sculpting, art, music, you name it. The epicenter of everything social and political. There was also religion. Boy, was there in Athens innumerable shrines and temples, statues of all the pagan gods you could think of. Pliny, who was a Roman historian at that time, uh, estimated that there were 73,000 statues of different pagan religious figures. And John Stott, in his commentary on Acts, he writes, quote, The Roman satirist hardly exaggerates when he says that it was easier to find a god than a man. So ancient Athens, the power and prestige of Washington, D.C., the academic environment of Oxford or Cambridge, the arts and culture of Paris, with a history, even at, that, oh, even at this time, of thousands of years. Again, American history, not even 250 years. And in that place steps the Apostle Paul. And will you stand with me as we read Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 34? Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him, as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, What does this babbler wish to say? Others said, He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears, and we wish to therefore know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. 
And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet, he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. So Paul arrives in Athens alone, having to flee from a mob looking for him in Berea. And immediately he is struck by the plethora of idolatry in Athens. Verse 16, the city was full of idols. And indeed it was. Again, plenty. Let's say even if he's off by a little bit, he estimated there are 73,000 statues. And that verb that's translated, the city was full, your translation may say something different. It's almost like saying it, the city was drowning in idols. So what does Paul do? Throw his hands up in despair, weep helplessly or curse and swear at the Athenians? John Stott rhetorically asks in his commentary. Does he just turn his nose up in disgust? Uh, shake his head, go to another town, move on? No. Like every other place he has been, he reasons with them. In the synagogue and the marketplace, and by marketplace, they mean the agora, where all the other philosophical and religious reasoning was happening. And Paul, it says, was doing this every day. We'll wait to focus on Paul's posture toward Athens when we look deeper next week at not only that, but then his testimony to the Areopagus. For today, what's important is just to recognize that he's out and about in both church and the town square engaging the people. And how is he received? Verse 18, well, what does this babbler wish to say? Paul engages with Epicureans and Stoics Two schools of philosophy we'll look at next week. So they were prominent academics of the day. And Paul is treated like a rube. As C.K. Barrett, esteemed longtime New Testament professor at University of Durham, England, Durham. And there's maybe a relation with him, but I digress. My grandmother, she's into genealogy. She's done some tracing. You don't care about any of that. But, but he says... That, and, and because he's a Barrett, he's a very esteemed New Testament scholar. He says that word translated babbler is like calling him a, just some third-rate intellectual devoid of method. And they even talk about him in the third person. It's like Paul's not standing here. What does this, what does this babbler wish to say? But then they up the ante in their accusations when someone suggests at the end of verse 18 that he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. And Luke adds, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And that was no random suggestion. It was no random accusation. Though there were indeed a litany of religions and mystery cults and weirdos and emperor worship in Athens, they all had some sort of Greco-Romanness to them. If they were official religions and they wanted any sort of permit to build or name anything, uh, they had to have the state's blessing for that, reinforcing the need for they better have, no matter what else they think, some sort of Greco-Roman loyalty to whatever their new religion they're wanting, permission to you know, state, be state-endorsed. 
And so if someone was accused of preaching foreign divinities, that meant something antagonistic to Athenian culture. And just to know what was at stake in that, Socrates was executed for, this was, quote, rejecting the gods and corrupting the youth. So he didn't kowtow to the pagan gods, and he was prominent enough to influence others. Obviously, he was Socrates. And so they executed him, executed Socrates. And if they'll do it to Socrates, they'll do it to anybody else. So all of this to say, Paul was received poorly. Some combination of mockery, and derision, and leveraging state threats against him. And why is he received that way? Because this is Athens. This is a place of world sophistication, where the wealthiest and wisest call home, where virtue and nobility are the highest ideals, where the highest of knowledge is pursued. This is a place of power and prestige, of precedent-setting government. It's a place of the finest of fine arts, art and sculpture and music and architecture to the envy of much of the world. This is a place of impeccable, refined culture, untainted by the brutish aspects of lesser people and places. This is a place that talk of Jesus of Nazareth, whoever knows where the heck that is, and resurrection, all of this by some wannabe traveling rabbi. This is a place that that kind of person and that kind of message just won't work. And yet, when you're sent with Jesus, sometimes it's to places it just won't work. That's how Paul is received, and yet he's given this incredible chance to give testimony to Jesus. Though derisive, these people, whoever they are, they sort of shrug and they tell Paul, you know, okay, tell you what, let us know, we want to know more about this new teaching. This is in verse 20. We want to know what this really means. So they bring Paul to the Areopagus, one of the most venerated law courts of Athens. It was a council for criminal and civil cases, not so much like a, a, a judge giving a ruling on some legal hearing. They were more sort of official, formal guardians of Athenian culture, of which obviously the law played a role, but they had a broader scope than that. So Paul gets this chance before this council, representative of the entire city and this group, this the Council of the Areopagus, they had the prestige of what our Supreme Court has, but they interacted in a sort of dialogical way, almost like a European parliament does. And so, Paul gets his chance. Off Paul goes. We'll look more next week at the content of his testimony, but the point is that he has this opportunity, and he takes this opportunity. Verse 32 after he's finished, some mock him. Some were more curious to hear him. Some joined him and believed, men and women. Presumably, he was given more chances to speak. We don't get further insight. But what we clearly see is that he had an impact. Despite the odds being against him, despite being mocked, despite the elitism of the city, despite him being all alone in many respects, despite it being the sort of place that this just won't work, Jesus and the testimony of and for him prevails. All of which begs the question, where are the places in your life that you've written off, dismissed, sort of shrugged your shoulders, defeated, as a place where this, it, it just won't work. Is it your work? School, for some of you? And for reasons perhaps similar to Athens. Well, you know, folks, look, folks, folks, they're just, look, they're concerned about different things there. 
They'll just roll their eyes at me, or they'll roll their eyes at anyone. You know, anything is possible, I guess, but, but, but me saying something, that, that just won't work. Is it hickory? This may be a surprising example, but you should give it some reflection. It may not be intentional, but have you concluded, perhaps unconsciously, you know, hickory... It is what it is. Now here's a thought experiment to know if you've made that decision, perhaps unaware. When's the last time you've actively thought about or been intentional or been on the lookout for opportunities to speak a word or embody a word for Jesus? Many of you have been on mission trips Many of you have been at some sort of function specific to evangelism. And you know the sort of hyper-awareness that you have at those of where are the opportunities. You're looking for the opportunities. You expect those opportunities. When's the last time you had that same awareness and expectancy on a Monday? On a Tuesday? If you can't remember, why not? Why would an opportunity to speak a word for Jesus not cross your mind? Embarrassed of Jesus? Probably not. I don't think that would be the case. Afraid of being embarrassed? Maybe. And only you and the Lord can unpack what that would reveal. Not confident in your own abilities? Maybe. Of course, that assumes that it's up to your abilities and not Jesus. Or could it be? Without you even knowing it or being aware of it, without actively choosing this to be so, you've nevertheless contented yourself that, you know, things just are what they are. They will be what they will be. What difference will I... Look, I just won't. That's for, the, that's for the church to do. And friend, if you are more concerned about what's happening on this platform once a week for the sake of the kingdom than you are your daily, ordinary life and where God has put you and the people he has surrounded you with and the opportunities that are there, then what has come from this platform has taught you wrong and your priority list of how God makes a difference in a city is out of order. For some, it may not be a place where it just won't work. It may be people where it just won't work. It may be friends. I've tried, Pastor. You don't understand. They don't want to hear that. It's complicated. Let me guess. It just won't work. It may be family. Same thing. I've tried, Pastor. You don't understand. They don't want to hear this. It's complicated. And it may not be extended family, though it may. For some, it may be immediate family. Kids, grandkids, siblings, parents, spouse. Let me guess. It just won't work. Maybe it's not a place or a people, but the times that we're in. Hello, pastor, we're in the middle of an 18-month and counting pandemic. People are stressed to the max, they're anxious, they're frustrated, they're on edge. They're not exactly waiting for a Bible study from me. Let me guess, it just won't work. Not right now, at least. Well, just keep in mind, just won't work wouldn't have taken Moses before Pharaoh. Just won't work wouldn't have split the Red Sea. Just won't work wouldn't have toppled the walls of Jericho. Just won't work wouldn't have kept Daniel from the lions. Just won't work wouldn't have protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the flames. Just won't work wouldn't have done battle with Goliath. Just won't work surely wouldn't have done battle with a sling and a stone. In the life and ministry of Jesus alone, just won't work wouldn't have healed the lame. Just won't work wouldn't have given sight to the blind. Just won't work wouldn't have opened the ears of the deaf. Just won't work wouldn't have healed the leper. 
Cyprus just won't work, wouldn't have calmed the seas, just won't work, wouldn't have multiplied bread and multiplied fish, just won't work, wouldn't have exercised demons, just won't work, wouldn't have gone to the cross, and just won't work, wouldn't have rolled away the stone. And in Acts alone, just won't work, wouldn't have brought men and women from all nations in unity, united by the Holy Spirit, just won't work, wouldn't have shaken walls at a prayer meeting, just won't work, wouldn't have made a lame man walk, just won't work, wouldn't have healed the sick, just won't work, wouldn't have transformed a murderous Saul into the apostle Paul, just won't work, wouldn't have taken Paul all around Southeast Asia, establishing churches, just won't work, wouldn't have opened prison shackles and opened jail sales and opened the heart of a jailer and his family and just won't work wouldn't have put Paul before the Areopagus to testify about Jesus. Now, who is it again and where is it again and what is it again that you're just so sure just won't work? Be very careful deciding for others what they're ready to hear or not hear, what they're open to or not open to, what God is doing in their lives and their hearts that you have no idea about. And speaking of him, be even more careful deciding for God what he can and can't do, where he can and can't work under the conditions that he can and can't prevail. The fact that you are there, wherever there is, with your family, with your friends, at your workplace, at places of service in the community, the fact that you are there, where you are, by nature, so is Jesus. And you are sent with Jesus there to the places it just won't work. But what if, like the countless examples in Scripture, what if it would work? What if 18 months and counting into a pandemic is precisely the time with anxiety and frustration and a lack of hope And you are in precisely the right places, surrounded by precisely the right people to make a difference for Jesus. And what if the only thing that all of that is waiting for is you? 